Okay, so this is key area four of unit two, physiology of health of higher human. And we're starting off by dividing this key area into two halves. This half is screening and diagnostic tests. The second half is all about genetic counseling and that sort of stuff. So we'll be looking at screening of pregnancies and diagnostic tests that are to do with anti and postnatal screening to start off. Okay, so in general, when we're talking about pregnancy screenings, there's two types that we talk about. We talk about either antenatal, which means before birth, so when the baby is still growing inside the womb, or postnatal, which is after birth screenings. And again, knowing these words is useful in terms of everything else that you're going to go on to do, is knowing what antenatal and postnatal means. It's going to really help if you know is the baby inside the mum or outside the mum. Okay, so antenatal screening monitors the health of the mother and the fetus, so both of them. And antenatal screening identifies the risk of a disorder and may allow for a prenatal before birth diagnosis to be given. Now, what this can allow for is parents might be able to make, a, if they find out that their child might have a severe disability, they can make an informed decision on whether to continue with the pregnancy or alternatively, the antenatal screening allows them time to prepare for a child with additional needs. Uh, so if they're planning to continue with the pregnancy, they get a little bit more time, a bit of warning uh, as to what they can expect. So in terms of antenatal screening, there are different techniques that are used as part of this. There is ultrasound scanning, which we'll touch on more in that specific in a minute, and blood and urine tests. So both of these are kind of used hand in hand as part of your antenatal screening. So when baby is still inside mum. Uh, if these screenings show any kind of abnormality or so anything potentially wrong with the baby, there are further diagnostic tests that can be carried out. But if these are fine, it's go on and just have a nice pregnancy, have a nice baby. Okay, so starting with ultrasound, the features that you need to know, there are two scans that happen during a normal pregnancy with no background health issues, that kind of thing. So the first scan is called the dating scan, and it does exactly what it says on the tin. It dates the pregnancy and the due date of the pregnancy. Again, there are particular stages of development that doctors know if it's three millimeters long, you are six weeks into your pregnancy. They know these facts, okay? So the dating scan happens at eight to 14 weeks, so sometime between that window. It dates the pregnancy, and it's used in combination with blood and urine tests. I don't know why the B has a capital letter, but it's used with blood and urine tests in order to look for any possible issues that are arising. The anomaly scan is 18 to 20 weeks, so later on in the pregnancy, and that will be after the fetus has developed things like arms and legs and, and all sorts of interesting, you know, normal bodily features. Um, and it's checking for physical abnormalities. Uh, so what we're looking for there is maybe limb deformation. Uh, they'll check things like the circumference of the head. They'll check the length of the femur and so the femur of the, le the main leg bone. Um, and they'll check the, the humerus length, so the main arm bone. And they'll just check for things like undergrowth or overgrowth of those areas. Uh, the blood and urine tests show us if certain chemicals maybe show up in the mother's blood that might indicate a certain problem. This is something that if there is an issue with the baby and how the baby is forming, sometimes different chemicals are produced that can be present in the mother's urine. Uh, these are called marker chemicals. So basically they tell us something is not quite right. And then if there is a problem with any of the ultrasound tests or these marker chemicals are present, that would indicate some kind of problem. And that's when diagnostic testing would be carried out. Okay, so it's important to stress, diagnostic testing, not for everyone, only for if blood and urine and ultrasound are showing an issue. So diagnostic testing, these are the two diagnostic tests that you need to know. Okay, so this is not part of the general screening for everybody. This is if the screening indicates an issue, we advance to the next level, which is diagnostic testing. And it's used to check for genetic abnormalities such as Down syndrome, Patel syndrome or Edwards syndrome. There's loads of others that it can check for. What we're looking for is big chromosomal abnormalities. So the two tests, the names of them are amniocentesis and CVS. But there's this thing in the red box that's quite important to know. Both of these tests carry a risk of miscarriage. So we don't do them for every pregnancy. And also, it's very much the parent's choice as to whether they want to do the diagnostic tests. Because say it's a couple who've been through several rounds of IVF and they didn't do PGS or PGD. And the diagnostic testing is indicate, or sorry, the, the uh, screening is indicating there might be an issue. They might go, you know what, we don't want to risk this pregnancy. We want to just have the baby born and whatever it is, we will love it and we will raise it. OK, um, so you've got to think about the, the compromise of this carries a risk of miscarriage. Do you want to know what your baby might have? 
Okay, so in terms of the diagnostic testing criteria, obviously there's the things that we've said in that if the ultrasounds or the marker chemicals suggest there might be a problem. There is also some other criteria that might result in you being able to get these diagnostic tests. Uh, the main things are if you're a high risk person, so women over the age of 35 are considered to be very high risk, or anyone who is maybe obese or has any other health condition that might potentially put them at more risk than other people and also just simply family history if this is something if there is a trait or uh, some some kind of genetic problem that has come up in your your family's history is something that you would then likely to be more or more likely to get tested for to see if that is the case with your child as well okay so let's look at, have a look at the first diagnostic test type and that is amniocentesis the picture here is showing what happens so what happens is a needle goes through the abdominal wall into the uterus, but not into the baby. That's a very, very important part there. Um, cells from the fetus are collected in the amniotic fluid. Now, skin cells are constantly being shed by us all the time. Babies are no different or fetuses are no different. They will shed skin cells into the amniotic fluid. So the aim is collect a sample of the amniotic fluid surrounding the baby, and it should contain some skin cells from the fetus. <coughs> Now, because there might only be a tiny number of cells, those cells need to be grown up in a lab to make a reasonable size sample. So then several weeks later, you can then do genetic testing in it. In terms of CVS, it stands for chronic villus sampling. Now, you do not need to know that this is what it stands for. But again, sometimes it's helpful. It tells you what it does. But CVS is sufficient. Um, the idea is that fetal cells are collected from the placenta, so surrounding the baby. Um, the cells are selected from that. And again, a karyotype is instantly done from this because um, it's from a large sample of cells. So slightly different in amniocentesis in that the karyotype is instantly done after it. So like within a day, is it? It's very, very quick. It's yeah. very quick. Can oh. it be less than a day? Uh, depends on the lab. Yeah. Yeah. But it's very, very quick, this one, this sampling method. Okay, so we've mentioned karyotype a couple of times. To confirm, a karyotype is a picture of a cell's chromosome. So this picture that is on this slide, that is a karyotype. OK, uh, what we are hiding with our little image box is the X or Y chromosome option. I think on this particular karyotype, it says uh, it's basically giving the options for both. So this person would be either XX and that would indicate a girl or XY and that would indicate a boy. OK, now it's possible to see chromosome abnormalities. So, for example, if I looked at chromosome pair number 21 down at the bottom there, if I saw three chromosomes sitting there, I would know this kid has Down syndrome. If I looked at chromosome number five and I saw that chromosome number five was a little bit short, I could go, aha, that's going to be Cree du chat. OK, so it's for big chromosome abnormalities is what karyotype picture is for. We're not going to see things like um, cystic fibrosis or sickle cell anemia, because remember, those are single gene mutations. They're not going to be visible on a chromosome. Okay, so to summarise this, the comparison of the diagnostic tests. So um, first of all, the amniocentesis and CVS, in terms of when it can be done during the pregnancy, is amniocentesis uh, can be done at 14 to 16 weeks, so slightly later, where CVS can be done slightly earlier, only 8 to 10 weeks in. If you have a look in your PLP, actually, there is a really good diagram of the amniocentesis sitting next to the CVS and the comparison. You can see the different stages of development. CVS, it's basically just a blob, whereas amniocentesis is recognisably a fetus. Oh, OK. Uh, the time taken to get results is around three weeks for amniocentesis versus 24 hours for CVS. Now, again, you've got to think about the options for parents. If parents are looking to maybe say that they would not want to continue with a pregnancy due to a severely disabled child, is the earlier that can happen, the better. So amniocentesis is a less good option for a lot of parents because that's a longer pregnancy, a more traumatic termination. Um, in terms of the location where the cells are collected from, during amniocentesis, the cells are collected from the amniotic fluid. During CVS, the cells are collected from the placenta. Okay. How the procedure is done, you can't get examined on this, but you might see it in a picture and have to recognise it. So for amniocentesis, it's a needle into the abdomen. Uh, for CVS, it's a catheter or a large needle through the cervix, so it goes in through the vagina, and it aims for the placenta. Okay. And the final one, which is kind of the big difference between mm. them, is a the risk of miscarriage. In amniocentesis, it is much, much lower than in CVS. So in terms of, there is a lot of things about amniocentesis that might not be as good in the fact you can't get it done till later. It takes much longer to find out. The chances of you potentially losing that baby is much, much lower. And that, for a lot of people, is a much bigger pro than just having to wait three weeks to find out about it. 
Okay, so that is uh, looking at antenatal screening and diagnostic testing. The next section that we're going to look at is genetic counselling and then we'll finish off with the little tiny, tiny bit on postnatal screening that you need to know on PKU.